Your dinosaurs are wrong is moving. Details after the video. Baron Norman and Barrett found Ornithoskeleta, a sister relationship between Ornithischians and Theropods, more parsimonious than the traditional Sauroschia arrangement. But that's not the whole story. There's more to phylogenetics than just finding the most parsimonious trees, and every decision workers make along the way affects the relationships they recover in the end. Workers have tested high-level dinosaur relationships before, as we've seen. What made the difference here was including non-dinosaur dinosauromorphs in the matrix. As we mentioned in the Archaeopteryx video, the way we determine which traits are plesiomorphic is to define outgroups. For example, a dinosauromorph, Dromomeron, and a dinosauriform, Hererosaurus, both have a scar on the front face of their thigh bone near the knee. Without Dromomeron in our matrix, we wouldn't be able to say whether that character state is plesiomorphic in dinosauriforms or just apomorphic to Hererosaurus. When ancestral conditions change based on new evidence, the derived states, and the groups they define, change with them. They did find that some poorly known dinosauromorphs lowered the Bremer support for certain clades. Surprisingly, this includes Dinosauria itself. Support is an answer to the question, how sure are we that these relationships are real and not a statistical anomaly? A clade's Bremer support value tells us how many extra steps we'd need to add to the tree for that clade to no longer be a parsimonious solution. Essentially, it looks at what the most parsimonious trees agree on. In this case, we can be pretty confident about the clades like Ornithoscelida and Ornithischia because thousands of trees concur that they're valid within four steps. But until we know more about animals like Saltipus, their uncertain relationships are going to have a fouling effect on Dinosauria. The proposed classification is not without critics, of course. The most controversial part is taxonomic and I already hinted at it. The authors propose several new definitions for existing names, including dinosaur itself. They're fine, but they want to use Saurischia for a much less inclusive clade of animals than it usually denotes, namely sauropodomorphs plus hererosaurids. Taxonomy isn't used this way. Now, anyone else who wants to talk about this group has to specify which Saurischia they mean. This is not to say we should never revise taxonomic definitions, this one is just so different from the word's established meaning that it's not useful anymore. Also, that Sauropodomorpha plus Hererosauridae clade doesn't seem very stable. Pari, Baron, and Vinther approach the data with different statistical and weighting methods. We can use maximum likelihood rather than maximum parsimony to select our optimal trees. Instead of counting steps between taxa, we calculate the probability of evolving between them. This is a method from molecular phylogenetics, where the character matrices are the DNA sequences of the taxa. Workers have been applying the model to morphological phylogenetics as well. That's the only data paleontologists can use, since DNA doesn't fossilize. It's not necessarily better than maximum parsimony, but it can solve some problems that parsimony struggles with. Pari et al. used a conditional likelihood called MKV. The condition is that workers only recorded characters which varied between taxa, which is what you do when you're acquiring data for parsimony analysis. But not having those constant characters in there would make a normal likelihood pretty inaccurate unless you have a huge number of taxa. So Ornithischia and Ornithoscelida, given the observations they made, both have a posterior probability of 1. Dinosauria itself, 0.96. Sauropodomorpha plus Hererosauridae has 0.66 or 0.65 when they treated certain characters as ordered. Pari et al. also tested Ornithoscelida using parsimony, but with different weighting methods. Weighting is a way to choose between trees of the same length. Workers have developed mathematical methods to make decisive characters heavier than indecisive ones, and then optimize for the tree with the lightest overall weight. The thinking being, characters which only change a few times are probably synapomorphies, so those should get more weight, and those that change all over the place are probably homoplasies, so they should get less. Pari et al. used implied weighting. They started with a very aggressive function, which really amplified those decisive characters, then walked it back in the direction of all characters being equal. Which broke up Ornithoscelida, but also made Baron et al.'s Saurischia mean the same thing as the old Saurischia. Hererosauridae plus Sauropodomorpha even became polyphyletic when K got above 15. 
Interestingly, using the data set as modified by Langer at all, even at the most aggressive k equals 3, Baron et al. Cerischia didn't include Herorosauridae, but Ornithoscelida was still intact. It seems that neither likelihood nor weighted parsimony find this clade, which were apparently redefining Cerischia to accommodate, as well supported as Ornithoscelida. As it happens, Baron and Williams evaluated the probably Herorosaur Cassiosaurus. They recovered herrerosaurs not only as not the sister group to sauropodomorphs, but as the sister group to dinosaurs. And also saltipus as a herrerosaur, which is neat. Uh, so no, I would argue creating such a flexible definition of Cerischia seemingly just for the sake of keeping the name around is not worth the trouble. I mentioned that Langer et al. corrected a wide swath of Baron et al.'s characters. Any cladistic analysis can, of course, only be as reliable as the data it's analyzing. So, were the author's character coding methods reliable? Within a week of the original paper coming out, Mickey Mortimer of the Theropod database wrote a really comprehensive rundown of the methodological quirks of the character set. She also had a talk on reevaluating Ornithoskeleta at SVP 2018, which I couldn't attend, so this summary I'm about to give might be out of date. Some characters are constant, they're the same for all taxa, which tells us nothing. Others are autapomorphies, they're the same for all taxa save one. These characters have the same length on all trees, so they're called parsimony uninformative. Mind, non-varying characters are useful if we use a normal likelihood, because it keeps branch lengths down. Maybe they included these because they knew someone would want to use maximum likelihood. There are a few traits grouped into a character, even though their congruence isn't that clear-cut. There are some correlated characters. That is, two or more characters represent the same feature. This unintentionally gives those features a heavier weight, because when one of those features changes, it gets counted twice or more. So what looks like a lot of equal weight characters is effectively just a few big fat ones. A few characters fail to take the animal's age and growth into account, they're coded as if we know something that we actually don't, and the authors ordered many of their characters, but more could have been. This doesn't distort the data exactly, but it can reduce the information it carries. Remember our example 2 from before regarding vertebrae with hollows or chambers? In this study, that's character 197. It has three states, solid, grooved, and chambered. The authors could have coded that as two on or off characters. This would have ignored that animals don't evolve chambers straight from solid bone, they first evolve grooves, so rightly the researchers coded it as ordered. In the binary method, Dilophosaurus is further from Coelophysis than either is from Herrerasaurus, but if the character is ordered, then there have to be two steps between Herrerasaurus and Dilophosaurus. Now we have a parsimonious solution. We also need to make sure that our character set can answer the question we're asking. There's an enigmatic dinosaur called Chilosaurus. They have a combination of Tetanurin, Solurosaur, Ornithischian, and even Sauropodomorph features. If you showed me a drawing of one of these, I would think you made up a dinosaur. Workers have generally recovered them as Tetanurin theropods. Two of the Ornithoscelida papers researchers plugged Chilosaurus into their character set, and they recovered it as the basal most Ornithischian. This would bridge the gap between Ornithoscelida's two subgroups. But that matrix doesn't include Chilosaurus' former tetanurin position. The only way to test whether they're more parsimonious there or at the base of Ornithischia is to use a complete taxonomic sample, and they didn't. Without tetanurins to compare them to, Chilosaurus is vulnerable to what's called long branch attraction. It's the same problem we always have with homoplasies. We have a lot of changes at individual sites, hence the name, long branch. The computer does its job and puts apomorphies on as few branches as possible. In maximum parsimony, the function wants character state changes to be synapomorphies. It optimizes against convergent or parallel evolution because that inherently adds steps. This doesn't mean Chilosaurus aren't basal ornithischians, the researchers just haven't shown that that hypothesis is better supported than the Tetanoran one. Also, the Bremer support is relatively low, except when they remove Pisanosaurus from the matrix. All this back and forth shows that neither hypothesis really has much more statistical weight than the other. I noticed Dr. Cow's 2018 paper on the assembly of the avian body plan recovered Ornithoscelida. 
That paper is brilliant, go read it, but I can't discuss it properly right now because I ain't doing a part three on this. Cow found Herrerasauridae splitting off before Sauropodomorpha, and some of the basal dinosaurs like Aoraptor are in different clades, but the simplest form of dinofuzz appears before the origin of the last Ornithoscelidan ancestor. That's the most interesting aspect of this whole reorganization to me. All the fluff is now in one subgroup. This may all seem like a lot of work to have gone through to come up with high-level relationships within the dinosaur clade are fluid right now. But that's okay. If anything, this should be a wake-up call that phylogenies are not dogma. If you find this area of research tantalizing, but you're discouraged that analyzing and reanalyzing the available data will only get us so far, there's good news. We can resolve this phylogenetic problem with fieldwork. So get out there and find us some Triassic dinosauromorphs to fill in the gaps in our matrix. So Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong is moving to a new YouTube channel, link in description and possibly in a card, and definitely at the end of the video as well. Uh, it's going to be the same content that we've been producing for this channel, though we may also experiment with some new stuff. Uh, the next episode we're going to be working on is a new toy episode uh, on Velociraptor. If you would like to support the show and get access to additional behind the scenes -y stuff, you should consider supporting us on Patreon, also link in the description and also at the end of the video. Uh, the existing episodes, including this one, will continue to be up here on the NSI channel. And we have created a handy playlist on the new channel for anybody who's looking for those. So remember to subscribe to that channel and ring the bell so that you get the notifications, and thank you for watching!